Here's the chapter three, properties of impure substances. And again, if you are following the 10th edition, this corresponds with chapter three. If not, um, you probably have a chapter just labeled pure substances. It, it follows uh, pretty sequential. Okay, so here's the objectives. The big one that we're gonna do is a PV, TV, PT, and PVT surfaces of the pure, di uh, pure properties and then um, substances, the phase changes, things like that, ideal gas equation, stuff like that. So what is a pure substance? A pure substance is a substance that has a fixed chemical composition throughout, okay? Air is a mixture of several gases, but it is considered to be a pure substance. So we have nitrogen and gaseous air are pure substances, and then a mixture of liquid and gaseous water is a pure substance, but a mixture of liquid and gaseous is not. Okay, so those are important to know, um, the division of these two right here. A mixture of liquid and gaseous water is a pure substance, so liquid and gas, but a mixture of liquid and gaseous air is not. So water is, air is not, okay? And then we've got phases, so um, this kind of just goes into it on a molecular level, but the molecules in a solid state are kept at their positions by a large spring-like intercollecting forces, right? So that makes sense. You're not going to have a sheet of metal doing this, right? That's a gas phase. Um, this right here is a liquid phase, so water. And then you have A at a relatively fixed solid state. So if you think of like ice cube and then water and then um, steam, like water, steam, steam from water. Okay, and so then when you talk about a compressed liquid, a subcooled liquid is a substance that is not about to vaporize. <laughs> It's not about to vaporize. You will see that about to happen a lot. So at one atmospheric pressure and 20 degrees Celsius, water exists in the liquid phase, compressed or subcooled liquid. And then um, saturated liquid is a liquid that is about to vaporize. Okay, so we have compressed liquids. It's not about to vaporize. And then you have saturated. It is about to vaporize. Okay, at one atmospheric pressure at 100 degrees Celsius, so you see the temperature change, water exists at a liquid that is ready to vaporize into saturated liquid. And then you have saturated liquid vapor mixture. It's the state at which the liquid and vapor phases coexist in equilibrium. This will make much more sense when we start looking at the PVT diagram, okay? Um, but just to note, so note that the temperature has changed and so what this is, is before at 100 degrees Celsius, it was about to vaporize. Well, before we can even think about the change of water vapor when you're boiling it, right? It doesn't happen at 101 degrees Celsius, right? It's, it's so small, we, we can kind of, to the best of our ability, measure it. But the change from liquid to vapor is so quick that we use things like about to vaporize. And so you can see that you're going to have, in, in a whole pot of water at 100 degrees Celsius doesn't go from completely liquid, you know, a gallon of, of 100 degrees Celsius water to uh, vapor all at once, right? Um, it's, a, it's an overtime uh, change. So you can see at that 100 degrees, now we have some vapor, but we still have liquid. So it's kind of like the in-between state. So as more heat is transferred, part of the saturated liquid vaporizes, which is the saturated liquid vapor mixture. It's uh, also called a two-phase mixture, right? Because you have saturated, and then you, uh, saturated liquid, and then you have vapor. So you have two phases. So they call it a two-phase mixture. And then when you get to saturated vapor, at one atmospheric pressure, the temperature remains constant at 100 degrees Celsius until the last drop of liquid is vaporized, right? So 
because the phase change happens in water at 100 degrees Celsius, that temperature is going to remain 100 degrees Celsius until all the water changes. You're not going to have 150 degree water because it would be vapor. You're not going to have 101 degree water. That would be vapor, right? So it's all happening at the same temperature. So you can think if you hold it at 100 degrees Celsius, that, could ha that, that process could take a long time. If you're rapidly heating it, it could take, I mean, almost no time, right? It, it could take just, it can be astronomically cool depending on if you're looking at a drop of water right? Or if you're looking at a pool of water, you know, that that's, it's, it's very um, circumstantial, but I want you to think when you start thinking of phases, think of boiling water, okay? And then you have superheated vapor, right? You're not going to have superheated liquid in a water. You're going to have superheated vapor because it's no longer a liquid. It's a vapor that is not about to condense, that is not saturated vapor, right? So as more heat is transferred, now we're at 300 degrees Celsius, the temperature of the vapor starts to rise, superheated vapor. So you definitely can get increased uh, heat. It's just going to be in a different phase. So here's the um, entire processes between one through five. So we just went through five processes, right? Five states. So it is reversed by cooling the water while maintaining the pressure at the same value. Okay, and this is a pure substances. So back to state one, let's go over to state one. What did we do? We raised that temperature to 100, right? And um, as we did that, we have the TV, which is the volume, um, volumes on this side, specific volume, because it's lowercase. And so we're, we're adding volume, we're getting more volume as the temperature rises. And then look, between two and three, we are holding steady. And even from three to four, we are holding steady, right? We are changing from this liquid to this vapor. All of this is within a two phase mixture. It's liquid and vapor. It's two phase mixture, all right? Phase mixture. Okay. And then once we get out of that, once we're all into vapor, that's when we can start increasing it, right? Because you can't have 300 degrees Celsius in liquid. You just, it's, it's all changed to lick to vapor. So then we start talking about superheated, um, vapor, right? And all of this, you see the, uh, P V T this is the PVT diagram on a two-dimensional plane. So we have temperature, we have vapor. Where's our pressure? Where's our pressure right here? This is the pressure line. This is following the pressure line, P, okay? So you will always have it. So if this is a PV diagram, this line right here would be temperature, right? So you're always gonna have that line representing the third one, okay? So for here, it's the phase change process of pure substances just continued, so the saturation temperature, because we've got a PT diagram, right? P saturated and T saturated. Okay, so the saturation temperature right here, um, I'll start here. The temperature at which water starts boiling depends on the pressure. Right, and, and if you don't know that that exists, you can think of um, pressure cookers. That's how it's used, is, is this process right here. The temperature at which pressure starts boiling depends on the pressure, therefore, if the pressure is fixed, so is the boiling temperature. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at one atmospheric pressure. What happens if you change the pressure? right? Because we've, we've assumed all of this at one atmospheric pressure. If you have a pressure cooker, right, that drastically increases the pressure on that water, then it's going to change the water temperature that it's boiling at. But we assume that it's one atmospheric pressure unless otherwise stated, okay? 
So the saturation temperature, Tsat, the temperature at which a pure substance changes phases at a given pressure, right? At a given pressure, given. And then saturation pressure, Psat, is the pressure at which a pure substance changes phase at a given temperature. So you need to know um, where that is. So at a given pressure and at a given temperature, depending on if it's Psat or Tsat, right? Okay, so they're just, they're together. They're just the opposites. Okay. And so here is saturation or vapor pressure of water at various temperatures, okay? So if you have um, 20, it's going to be at a Psat of 2.34, right? Um, see here. This is an easiest one. So you can start here. I find it easiest to start here. And it's at one atmospheric pressure. Okay. And then if you want to boil water at 50 degrees Celsius, well, then you know that you need 12.35 PSAT. Okay. If you want to, <laughs> you can get way up there too, right? So just um, kind of letting you know the relationship between those. Okay. And then let's just go over some terminology. You're going to need to know what latent heat is. It's the amount of energy absorbed or released during a phase change process. Um, this is like not the cleanest um, example, but a good example is if you ever have heat when you get out of bed, like if it's really cold um, and you have maybe been overheated and sweated a little bit, that latent heat that's left over in your bed is that latent heat. Latent heat effusion is the amount of energy absorbed during melting, okay? It is equivalent to the amount of energy released during freeze freezing. And then latent heat of vaporization, so it has it at each one, is the amount of energy absorbed during vaporization, right? So that makes sense. Um, and it is equivalent to the energy released during condensation. So it has those relationships. So uh, it's Fusion, it's absorbed during melting, and it's equivalent to the amount of energy released during freezing. And then we have vaporization, and it's released during condensation, and, um, uh, sorry, it's absorbed during vaporization, and then it is equivalent to the energy released during condensation. And the magnitudes of the latent heat depends on the temperature pressure at which the phase change occurs. That always, right, it always depends because these are, are um, you can't change one without changing the other. You, if you change pressure, temperature and volume are going to change. Um, you know, and even not changing is it can be considered right because you can hold one steady, but they have a relationship between them. So at one atmospheric pressure, the latent heat effusion of water is three thirty four kilojoules uh, kilojoules over kilograms, and the latent heat a vaporization is 220, uh, 2257 kilojoules over kilograms, okay? And then atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure, um, and thus the boiling temperature of water decreases with elevation. That's interesting. So it takes a little less if you're up on a, on a super high mountain. And then here's a table for you to show that elevation and that change. Okay, and then here's some consequences of Tsat and Psat dependence. And so this talks about um, how these happen. So you have the insulation, you have the te test chamber, you have 25 degrees Celsius, um, and then you have uh, liquid in two. So you have negative 196 Celsius down here at the bottom. Okay. And then um, when it goes around, you have negative 196 coming out. And so just talking about that, the temperature of the liquid nitrogen exposed to the atmosphere remains constant at negative 196 degrees Celsius, and thus it maintains the test chamber at negative 196 degrees Celsius. So it's just talking about um, how, how liquids remain constant and the phase change of a pure substance. And this insulation is definitely critical because then you're not getting things in over here, right? It's just happening here. And therefore, it, it, it's, this is 
you can view this, if that was a little confusing, you can view this as reaching equilibrium. Okay, the variation of the temperature of fruits and vegetables with pressure during vacuum cool, cooling from 25 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's look at this PVT diagram. Okay, and even though you're only seeing it on a, on a, whoop, on a two, two dimensional plane. So we have T over here, P. Okay, and so what you get is um, this is going backwards, right? So you've got start of cooling, you've got something cooling down, right? From 25 degrees Celsius to zero. So we've got from 25 degrees Celsius to zero. So what happens? We've got pressure that is going to start here. And then as we reduce the pressure, we're going to go until we get to, and we're going to maintain at 25 degrees and then we're going to then start climbing down with the steady increase or decrease of pressure. Okay. And we're going to keep on going. And then we have right here, the end of cooling. And so this would be 25 degrees Celsius. This would be T1. And this pressure would be P1 because this is state one. And then right here, this is going to be T2. And this is going to be P2 because this is state two. <laughs> and so in here, we've got phase change process of pure substances still continued. And in 1775, ice was made by evacuating the airspace in a water tank. So that's actually how it was, it was made. And this is a really good um, semblance of a refrigerator or a freezer. You do you do artificially cool the things in it, but not by injecting the cool air per se. It's really by removing the heat. So an absence of the heat causes the drop in temperature and causes things to freeze or um, get colder. And so this one was by evacuating the airspace in a water tank. And, and thus uh, it, it was a pressure change as well. So here is um, a, P, a TV diagram. So we have T and we have V. And so all of these lines, what are these? These are all pressure lines, right? Because it's a PVT diagram, right? We have our T right here. We have our V and we have all of our pressure lines. That means all of these lines are gonna be pressure because it is a PVT diagram you are going to become so familiar with this PVT diagram. You will almost only ever work with it on a two-dimensional plane. We will never work on it with a Z-axis. You will, you will have to know what it looks like, you, you, and you will know what it looks like, and you'll have to be able to work within it, but you will work on versions of it, the TV, the PV, and the PT, things like that. Okay? And then the critical point, which is really important, this is the point at which saturated liquid and saturated vapor states are identical, okay? This will make much more sense when we start working into the lines because you'll actually see a bell curve, and that'll make sense. But this is really important to know. The critical point is the point at which the saturated liquid and saturated vapor states are identical. Okay. Oh, you see right here. This is the critical point, right? So this is the, whoops, this is a saturated liquid line right here. You know what? Um, let's see. Do I have, well, I'll just do it in red. So this is a saturated liquid line right here, this green line. Okay. And then when we get up to here and we have right here, we have T and V the same at saturated liquid and at saturated vapor, that's the critical point. It's the point at which these lines meet and then the state for PVT, because this is the, uh, this is TV, so this is gonna be um, our pressure lines right here. This is the state at which the temperature and volume and everything are the same. And so then we have pressure lines right here, right? P2 and then P1 and this is changes. Right here, at the critical point, 
you can split this in half right here. Okay. And all of this side right here is all compressed liquid. Okay. And then everything over here, everything over here is superheated vapor region. Okay. So left of the critical point, not underneath the bell curve. Okay, so outside of the saturated liquid line, so here's the saturated liquid line, everything over here is a compressed liquid. So it's liquid and it compressed liquid region, right? And then everything on the right side of this critical point and outside the saturated vapor line is the superheated vapor region. Okay, anything on this line, of course, is going to be saturated liquid line. Anything on this line is going to be saturated vapor line, of course. And then everything under here, everything under this bell curve, every single thing is two-phase mixture. Two-phase. It's both liquid and vapor. Okay, two-phase mixture. And this is really just uh, more of the same, but the pressure in a piston cylinder device can be reduced by reducing the weight of the piston. That makes sense. So you have, you not only have atmospheric pressure weighing down, but you have weights as well. That makes complete sense. So if you remove one, you are uh, decreasing the weight. Okay. And so um, extending the diagrams to include solid phase, so I, we can kind of go over this, but we're not going to go too far into it because we've been working with uh, solid and uh, vapor or liquid and vapor so much. But when you get to solid, so the vast majority of what you're going to be working on is, is just within the compressed liquid and the superheated vapor region and then um, on these liquid and vapor lines and then within the two-phase mixture. That's basically where you're going to be working, but they do have it to represent the solids as well. And so um, here's something that contracts on freezing. And so what you'll see is, is, of course, if it's solid, your volume is going to be unchanged. So even with a decrease in pressure, your vapor is going to be the same because it's, it's a solid. That makes sense. And then as it's melting, so think of like an ice cube and it's melting, then it's changing. It's just changing in volume, right? You could think of volume getting bigger, but the pressure can still go, go down, right? It's, it's, as you decrease, it's, it's just getting less in volume. Um, and then you start getting into liquids and vapors and, and such like that. Okay, and so we do have the triple point as well. And so... At triple point pressure, at triple point pressure and temperature, a substance exists in all three phases in equilibrium. So a triple point is just when it's vapor, liquid, and solid. And I don't want you to think that it's a, it exists there and it's being held there. It's more for when these are about to change, right? So you've got the uh, temperature triple point, and then you've got the pressure triple point. Okay, and then when we start talking about sublimation, it's passing from a solid phase directly into the vapor phase. So that's just completely skipping the liquid phase altogether, and that's sublimation. Okay, they even have like t-shirt uh, printing, they call sublimation, or um, like cup printing. So it's passing from a solid phase directly to the vapor phase. At low pressures, below the triple point value, solids evaporate without ever melting first, which is sublimation. And then here's some phase diagrams again. And so you have vapor, uh, you've got the triple point right here, and then you've got melting, um, melting, and then the vapor, vaporization. And then, of course, you see the sublimation over here on the other side. Okay, so here is a 3D representation of the PVT diagram. Okay, and so I know that it looks a little weird, but think of it if you have, um, so here's P, 
V, and it's always specific, and then T. So I want you to think of it, and they have it over here with um, – oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, think of it like this. If you have a P over here, so this is your Y axis, okay? And then you have T over here, which is the X axis. And you start working up through here. You're going to have changes like this, right? Um, and so these lines are where we start getting into um, volume, things like that. Or if this is a PV diagram, you know, this would be temperature, you know, things like that. So these lines through here. And this is the one that we mostly work with. You see that critical point where you have the solid and vapor or liquid vapor region. We mostly work within this portion right here. And you see the superheated vapor region and the compressed liquid vapor region. This is mostly where we work. And so what you're doing is you're taking one of these or if you're, you know, turning it on its side. And this is the y-axis, things like that. So this is the 3D diagram. Again, you're not going to work with it on here, um, not too much. You're mostly going to work in just the 2D versions. Okay, so for most substances, the relationships among thermodynamic properties are too complex to be expressed by simple equations. Therefore, properties are frequently presented in the form of tables, and we will be using the tables a lot and they, you will be, I know that it's going to be a lot, and, and you're going to think, oh my gosh, why are you making me use all of these tables? But, but just believe me and thank me, <laughs> because it's, I would not want to do the other things required for the tables. Okay. So then just, this is a little excerpt of, this, of the tables, but you can see over here, if you have a temperature at a given saturation, then you have the saturated liquid volume and the saturated vapor volume here. And so you see liquid is denoted by F, and then vapor is denoted by G, the subscript, and it is in the unit meters cubed over kilogram. Okay, so this is just, we'll start working through them, but, and um, we have a copy of them, but here is uh, also just a little formula. If you have saturated vapor at, I'm sorry, specific volume, <laughs> uh, saturated liquid and saturated vapor. So subscript FV, it equals VG less VF. So then we talk about enthalpy of vaporization, and that's the latent heat of vaporization. And so you see uh, enthalpy is denoted by H, and it's the amount of energy needed to vaporize a unit mass of saturated liquid at a given temperature or pressure. It represents the amount of energy needed to vaporize a unit of mass of saturated liquid at a given temperature or pressure, and it decreases as the temperature or pressure increases and becomes zero at the critical point. So here's just a representation of all of that. And so you can see the schematic of the TV diagram. And so it's just it's just going through the three um, things that we just we just walked over. And then we talk about quality. So quality is really important and it's in between zero one and it is a percentage. So the quality is only occurring under the bell curve or kind of bell curve it only occurs in here under the two-phase mixture and the quality so if you have a zero like zero percent then it's saturated liquid and if you have one percent it's saturated vapor and so if you have you know if your line is like this Right, so this is uh, P or T, it doesn't matter. So one of these is going to be P or T. So if this is P, this is going to be T, right? If, if this is T, this would be P. Um, and so here's that line right here. So when we start getting into here and we are holding constant at a pressure or at a temperature, in this case, I made this my T line. So if we are holding constant at, at this P, 
under here when you're changing, you're going from 0% quality to 1 or 0% or to 100%. So right here, you're going to have uh, 0.5 or 50% uh, quality, right? Right here, it's going to be 0.25 or 25% quality. And so what this quality does is the ratio of mass of vapor to the total mass of the mixture. And so it's measuring this vapor, so 25% vapor, 50% vapor, 75% vapor. And so what it's doing is it's telling you where at under this bell curve your phase is, your, your mixture is, okay? And so right over here you have a formula to remember. And then you have mass total equals the liquid plus the vapor. So you see V, um, right, because this is... Uh, this F is liquid, and this subscript is vapor. That's really important to remember, and the stu students really tend to get those mixed up. Okay, two-phase system can be treated as a homogeneous mixture for convenience. So um, you can just do interchange between these two is all I'll say. So lots of formulas over here. It's good to note um, you know, V equals uh, VF plus VG, and then you get into masses. And we just, we've kind of walked through some of these. We've got qual um, quality, you know, so we've got, we've got, you know, we're going to work through these. So quality is related to the horizontal distances PVT diagram. So we, we talked about that, right? Okay. And the V value of a saturated liquid vapor mixture lies between VF and VG makes perfect sense um, because the the VF and VG is denoting for liquid or vapor, okay? And here's just some more schematics just showing you kind of uh, where you're at or where you could be, right? So here, if VF is here and VG is here, and then you would be you know, halfway through, or not even halfway through, you know, and then the same, right? So you've got changes in, on the TV diagram and the PV diagram, okay? Um, not going to go into these really too much because we're actually going to work them. So you have uh, lower pressure, which is pressure is less than PSAT at a given T. Okay. Higher temperatures is temperature is greater than TSAT at a given P. Everything is at a given, right? Higher specific volume. Volume is greater than VG at a given P or T. Internal energies. So you've got U, which denotes internal energies. Um, and then H is for enthalpies. And those are um, at a given P or T. T and in the region to the right of the saturated vapor line and at a temperature above the critical point, a substance exists in a superheated vapor, right? So remember, we've got this, the superheated vapor. Here's the critical point and here's the superheated vapor region, okay? In this region, temperature and pressure are independent properties. Okay, that's important to know. Right here, that's a, actually a really good question. Okay, here's a partial listing. The tables are like, they're just pages and pages long. This is like one small excerpt of a very large page of multiple pages. Compressed liquid properties depend on temperature much more strongly than they do on pressure, but they do still depend on all, right? Okay, so here's a more accurate relation for H. It just means that it just depends on temperature much more, okay? And so here you've got higher pressures. P is greater than PSAT at a given T. So we can we could go through. You can read through all of them. Um, but here's a schematic of a TU diagram, okay? Remember, U is internal energy, okay? And so here is given P and T, you can get specific volume, internal energy, and enthalpy if you have these two, okay? At given PT, a pure substance will exist in compressed liquid if T is less than TSAT 
at P, right? Because we're coming off. So here's the saturated liquid line, right? But if our T is less than, right, less than our, our T sat, then we're in the compressed liquid region, right? We, we've already talked about that. Here's some references. The value of U and H and S cannot be measured directly. They are calculated from measurable properties using the relationships between the properties. We're going to pull these from tables and be able to calculate them. However, those relations given the changes in properties, not the values of properties at a specific, uh, specified states. Therefore, we need to choose a convenient reference state to assign the value. So the reference state for water is 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. And for R134A is negative 40 degrees Celsius in the table. The reason I find all of this important, other than what it says, but you start working these, is we have tables for specific working fluids as well. So not everything is water. We'll be working with water, air, R134A. They have, um, you know, all kinds of different tables. Okay. And, oh, here's a little good blurb. However, in thermodynamics, we are concerned with the changes in properties and the reference state chosen is of no consequence in calculations, right? Because we're, worried, we're concerned about what happens within the states, from state one to state two. We're not, and we want to see how those change in the properties. We're not, we don't care of like what, which state is from where, right? We, we're just using it to calculate. Here is a good picture of the tables. Uh, this is just one line. And so you see you have at a given T and at a given P, you have all of this. So at 0 0.01 degrees Celsius and at 0.6117 kilopascals in pressure, PSAT, you have VF, you have VG, you have internal energy, VF, VG, I mean, UF, UFG, and UG. And then you have enthalpy, HF, HFG, HG, and then you have entropy too, which um, we'll get into more in when we start working in thermo too. Um, SF, SFG, and SG, right? And this is for saturated water. And then you'll get to a different table, which is refrigerant 134A. And then again, at a given T and at a given P, you have all of this, right? So it's just, it's just reading the table to get those. So equation of state is any equation that relates the pressure, temperature, and specific volume of a substance. So when you think about the PVT diagram, right? Like I'm drawing this for you <laughs> and you've got PVT, any equation relating to this, is equation of state equation of a state because we're gonna have states state one and we're gonna be able to plot it here okay you're gonna have state two and it may be so here's state one here's state two we're gonna have equations to calculate how we get from here to there right and so it's an equation of state and when we have a state, it's a relationship between P, T, and V of a substance, depending on if it's water, air, R134A. Okay. The simplest and best known equation of state for substance in the gas phase is the ideal gas equation. This is fantastic because if, once you are able to identify ideal gas, then you can just use that formula. It's really fantastic. And this equation predicts the PVT gas behavior quite accurately within some property selections. And this is PV, PV equals MRT, right? And so what we have is you can see that we take M into it. So it's PV equals RT. And then that's the ideal gas equation of state. And then I will call it sometimes PV equals MRT because we start going into uh, specifics of, of it, right? Like, so you've got molar mass. You start taking into account the, uh, the mass basis of it as well. 
and you've got this one as well. So you've got you've got a couple different ones, but it's by and large actually known as PV equals MRT or PV equals RT, just depending on like what you're trying to get to or what um, what data you're using. If you'll notice, this R right here takes into account um, masses here. Okay. So different substances have different cast constants. R is a constant. Okay. And so you have those data here. Okay. Mass, of course, um, is molar mass times the mole number and uh, various expressions of ideal gas equation. And this is where that, here, there it is. PV equals MRT, there it is. Um, and it's the ideal gas equation at two states for a fixed mass. So it's really just working them around to be able to solve for your um, ideal gas. Okay, is water vapor an ideal gas? At pressures below 10 kilopascals, water vapor can be treated as an ideal gas regardless of its temperature. This is incredibly important to know. Is water vapor an ideal gas? Because you'll need to know when to use these formulas and which formula to use, right? And the ideal gas law, especially compared to the others, is just makes things really simple. At higher pressures, the ideal gas assumption yields unacceptable errors, particular in the vicinity of the critical point in the saturated vapor line. So if it's under 10 kilopascals, you can use, and it's water vapor, um, you can use the ideal gas law. In air conditioning applications, the water vapor in an air can can be treated as an ideal gas, why? And then, because um, we are talking about pressure, right? in a air can. In steam power plants applications, the pressure involved are usually very high, therefore ideal gas uh, relations should not be used. Okay, and here's another um, PVT diagram, okay, because we've got T and we've got V, and what are all of these lines? You can even tell by kilopascals. These are all pressure lines. All these are P, V, V, V. These are all pressures, all the pressure lines, okay? And so here we've, um, we've just got uh, that, that this percentage error, we, it's just talking about error, involved in assuming steam to be an ideal gas in the region where steam can be treated as an ideal gas with less than 1% error, okay? So it's just showing you why you can assume that when you're dependent on the pressure. So then you do have a compressibility back factor Z, and it's a factor that accounts for the deviation of real gases from ideal gas behavior at a given temperature and pressure, and um, then to real gases. So here you've got V ideal, and then it's RT over P. So you, you see you're still like using those formulas as well. Oh, and then Z e is equal to one for ideal gases. And then the farther away Z is from unity, the more the gas deviates from ideal gas behavior, okay? And then gas behave, gases behave as an ideal gas at low densities, that is low pressure, high temperature. And then what is the criteria for low pressure and high temperature? The pressure or temperature of a gas is high or low relative to its critical temper, temperature or pressure. Again, we're just gonna, we're gonna work. That's right. So, but important at a very at very low temperatures, all gas, all gases approach. Look, at very low temperatures, all gases approach ideal gas behavior, regardless of their temperature. So, ideal gas and the behavior of those and using those formulas is heavily dependent on this pressure right here. Okay. And so then here we've got um, our Z tables because we will be using those as well. There are much less of them. And if you wear glasses or should wear glasses and don't, I will implore you to get them because it is extremely hard to read the Z tables. There's, um, and they're, they're, it's different from um, like a statistics Z table if you've taken statistics yet. Um, but 
it's it, <laughs> the fines are so little and I will work with them, but they are, they are, it's very difficult to see them. So, but here's some uh, formulas here when you're talking about reduced pressure, reduced temperature, and pseudo reduced specific volume, and just kind of how those flow on a, on a form. And then here you've uh, got a formula over here, but really basically what it's saying is gases deviate from the ideal gas behavior the most in the neighborhood of the critical point. So the relationship between, and this is a pressure line, right? It's because you've got a T and a V. And remember, our ideal gas behavior is so critical of our pressure. And so it's, it deviates the most in the neighborhood of the critical point, okay? And, and much more when you start backing away from it. And there you've got a, a compressibility factor. Uh, can also be determined from a knowledge of PR and VR. Okay, the ideal gas equation of state is very simple. Very, it is very simple, but its range of applicability is limited, right? Because it only works if it's less than, if it's superheated vapor, water vapor, less than 10 um, in pressure, right? Like when you're just talking about, oh, well, but kind of this, you know, but when we start getting to the critical point, oh, we kind of can't use that. So it is very limited, but it is very simple. It is desirable to have equations of state that represent the PVT uh, behavior of substances accurately over a larger region with no limitations. Of course we love that. Um, such equations are naturally much more complicated and several equations have been proposed and so here we have um, some of them that have been proposed through history. And then here is uh, Van der Waals equation of state to kind of help more um, simplify, but reach a larger range of what we can use them for. And then this is the B.D. Bridgman equation of state. And then the Benedict Webb Rubin equation of state. And then, um, but constants that appear in the Beattie Bridgman and Benedict Webb Rubin equations of state, they are here. So they have actually calculated um, just certain constants they have found, you know, um, when P, and even here, when P is in kilopascals, um, V is in meters cubed over, uh, over kilomoles, and T is in Kelvin, and R, U is equal to 8.314, um, kilopascals times meters cubed over kilomole Kelvin, the five constants in <laughs> B.D. Bridgman equations are as follows. So they were able to find when all of this was happening, when that pressure was this, when that volume was this, when this temperature was this, when this R was exactly this, we have some constants, right? And so it's just still so finicky. Um, and they try to make it a, a lot easier with with proposing these formulas, but they still are so susceptible to having, you know, you need an exact temperature, things like that. It's just, it is very finicky. Okay, and then here's complex equation of state that represent PVT behavior of gases more accurately over a wider range. And so they, they do have them. Um, and here's the percentage of error that goes with various, um, equations. And so you can see here that, that they are pretty accurate given their, their standard of error. Okay. And then here, this is just what we went over. It's really the, the thing that I really want you to take out of here is the definitions when we're talk, talking about what a pure substance is. Um, you know, what, what a pure substance is and then when we're talking about what the phases of a pure substance are, the phase change process of the pure substances, property diagrams, property table, ideal gas equation of state, and what that really means, you know, when we're talking about PVT, the compressibility uh, factor, and then to just become familiar with other equations of state. Um, but we are going to keep it moderately uh, simple for this course as well. And um, really to just know that PVT diagram, PVT diagram. And, you know, when you have here, and you have PV, and you have something that kind of looks like that, and you have a temperature, 
line right here, right, for our PVT diagram, just know that that critical point is here. Go and um, start, go back to the portion where I talked about, you know, this is the liquid region, and this is the, um, the compressed, and this is the superheated vapor region. And then you've got the saturated, saturated liquid line, and then you've got the um, vapor line here. And then under all of this, you've got the two-phase mixture. And then depending on here, you've got, you know, 0% quality. And then over here, you have um, quality is equal to 100%. And then, you know, this would be 50% quality, right? So just go and uh, make yourself familiar with the parts of the PVT diagram because that you are going to be working in that so much and you're going to need to go in and work your states as well. Okay, I think that's it.